I'm good. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming to our talk on workload lifecycle management with heat. My name is Lance Haig. I'm a solution architect with Marantis, and this is Florence Stinkau. Stink Thank you. Thank you. Uh, who's a system architect with Marantis. We both work out of Germany. Um, what this talk is about today is that we, you know, OpenStack community has got really good at deploying or is improving the process of employing, of deploying and, and creating clouds. And that is in turn making it easier for the users or more and more customers to start deploying these clouds. But unfortunately, there's a, a, a kind of a lack of uh, information on how one could use the default tool set that comes with uh, OpenStack to be able to use the cloud effectively without having to re, re, uh, retool or, or reskill people on all different types of technologies and um, environments that would needed to deploy these applications. So this talk about us is, is, that we're giving is, is to um, enable the, us to show you the value and the advanced way that you can use heat with uh, software deployments to uh, make your deployments and your lifecycle management of your applications much easier to manage and handle. So the agenda for today uh, is going to be what are workloads, what we see as workloads, um, and the OpenStack deployment options that we've got, the uh, software deployments overview, so how, you know, what is software deployments, how it works, the and the framework that we've uh, created to work with heat and software deployments to make things easier for people to use. Um, uh, and um, we've got a, a demo on reverse proxy and demo with Kubernetes cargo um, to show you the more complex part of it. And then we'll have a wrap up and some uh, questions and stuff afterwards. The, uh, the first part is uh, what is a workload? Now a workload is, is made up of a number of parts. Initially it's the infrastructure deployment and then the software configuration deployment. Then you've got, you need to have software configuration lifecycle management on top of that and also your infrastructure lifecycle management. So this, you know, this is a standard thing that we've seen across all the technologies and environments. Um, it's a standard practice in, in, in most businesses that we need to have this stuff happen. And we normally use a, a number of tools to make this happen where we think that we could use heat itself to do this type of stuff for us without having to um, spin up extra things. So there's uh, different, five different types of workload deployment that one can use in OpenStack. As we all know, there's the manual, all manual deployment. So this is where a user goes in and creates all their resources themselves, having to link them, create networks, create environments, uh, volumes, instances. Uh, but it's, it's, it doesn't get very complex because you can't, you can't really spin up a cluster from the, the, the heat UI. There's some disadvantages of C to this. Um, there's a, it's slow and it's error prone. It's not repeatable. It's not, it's, it's not, there's no lifecycle management. So, you know, if you want to increase the number of nodes, it's not easy or you, you, there's no option really. Um, there's no easy way to group your infrastructure into a group of things to be able to make clusters. There's just, there's no way of doing it. Although this is quite trivial to do, so you can really go in and, and configure all the environment yourself. This is still a very, very, popular way of people doing stuff. We've noticed it in the customers we've been dealing with that they still do this. They go through and create this manual infrastructure and think, okay, great, my application is now in the cloud and it's, it's good. And we all know that that's uh, probably not the best way to do it. The second one is where you build your infrastructure with heat, but then you still do your manual software configuration. So as we, you know, a user goes in, creates the infrastructure with their heat template. They spin up an X number of machines and then log into each machine individually and start manning it, manually installing and configuring the software to be able to do the tool that they want or the, the product or the project they want to do. There's a number of advantages to, to this. Um, the heat template now serves as the recipe for the infrastructure deployment. So you get a repeatable process. Whenever you run this heat template, you will always have the same number of machines or the same infrastructure, which is really good. So it's something that you can rely on being there. It also heat can be leveraged to, to link all these resources together. So you've got a network and a, a router and a disk that all gets plugged in together to make this a really good uh, solution on in your infrastructure. And then infrastructure lifecycle management can be done. So you can then uh, can be used. So you can take your uh, cluster and spin up two, three, four, five, six nodes, and it'll just automatically create the empty machine for you. 
The unfortunate part of this is that, or the, the disadvantage, is, as, if, if you will, is that every time you redeploy or you scale, you have to manually log into the scaled out node, go and configure it, manage it, and do everything else manually. So this is a time consuming and not something that's uh, automatable. And also then there's no software configuration lifecycle management. So you can't automatically upgrade or change things within your software configuration. The next version is software configuration, infrastructure with heat software configuration with via cloud init. Now we know cloud init is a deployment method at system boot. We've all known that we've, you know, as OpenStack users, we know that a lot of this stuff can be done in cloud init. Um, and it, the, the, the different advantage or the advantage here that, uh, that's different to the previous slide, you'll see there's a number of commonalities here where we still have the recipe, we still have the, um, the resources involved and linked to each other. Um, and the infrastructure lifecycle management can be done. What the best thing is that we've got a one-click redeployment. So you can literally run a type of command or hit an enter key and voila, you have this redeployment. And the software gets generated and configured and everything else by heat, which is the, heat, the, the cloud in it, which is really a good um, way of doing things. The disadvantage is that um, there's no software configuration lifecycle management. So if you update anything in your cloud in it library, it will destroy and recreate the machine. So anything that was on there is gone. And it's not something that probably that some people want within their environment. So it doesn't, it's not a, 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 a way of keeping some of the transient data or, or keeping your system or your, or your environment up and running. It deletes the whole lot and recreates it. And that's not a, 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 um, something we want to happen. So the next one is software configuration with, with cloud in it, but when we install a cloud management, a configuration management tool, X configuration management tool. Again, uh, we use cloud in it to deploy the configuration uh, management tool library, or at least uh, agents. These agents then, once deployed, spin up, they connect to your configuration management master and get their configuration and run. The, the advantages, that the, the extra advantage we get from the previous slide is that you get software lifecycle management. The disadvantage, unfortunately, is that then now you've got two places to manage code and to manage uh, different configurations and things. So it becomes really, uh, which way do we change this feature or this thing to be able to make it work for us? And then the, the last one in this group is where we use the heat infrastructure with heat, which is really good, software configuration with heat software deployments. Now this, uh, you know, there's, the way that this works is that the, the software deployments part of heat, which we've, uh, is a, a resource in the, in the heat uh, environment, um, can now be utilized to manage the software configurations. So again, we get the very commonalities of the recipe for the infrastructure. Uh, it can be linked to link all the, the devices together. The infrastructure lifecycle management head is easy. You can spin up uh, five, six, seven nodes, easy, down, up and down. A redeployment is easy, as we said before. The software life cycle management happens as well. And there's a single point of control. This is the key thing, is that you've got one place that you run everything from. You'll create, you'll update, you'll delete. These are the tasks you run from one, one plane of glass, if we want to call it that. And then I'll hand on to Florin. We'll take off on with the software deployments. Thanks, Lance. So, so what are software deployments, right? So basically, software deployment is a type of resource in Heat that applies a, so a Heat software config resource to a particular instance, right? So in order to work with software deployments, uh, there's a number of agents that need to be available on the instance. Uh, and these can be made available by either prepackaging them in the image that you're going to spin up your instance with, or you're going to be using Cloud init to basically spin them up, right? Uh, and basically what they do is they'll continuously pull heat uh, for software deployments that are assigned to that particular instance. So in short, you know, it's basically he provides us with a configuration management engine, right? That, will, that can be used to apply software configurations to these various instances. So let me give you a very simple web server example. So you have on the right hand side of the screen, you basically have uh, a, a software config uh, resource uh, in heat and this is basically just it's an encapsulation for a type of script. Um, and you can see in the config attribute of it that basically this is just a hello world for installing an Apache web server. And there's also a group attribute, which I'll get to in a minute. Just wanted you guys to keep that in mind. And on the bottom, we have the actual software deployment um, definition, right? So in here, you can basically see that there's a config uh, attribute, which basically points to the HTTP config that we have above. Then we have the server, which is the actual instance that this should be installed to. 
Uh, and then we have two more attributes, so one of them being the signal transport. And this basically is the method in which the, so the agents on, on running on the instance will notify heat of the status of the software deployment. And then we have actions, and these can be, there's four of them. You can be create, update, suspend, and delete. And this basically tells the software deployment at what stage of, of, the, of the process this actually should should happen, right? So for example, like I create, when you first create the stack or delete, so for example, like if you have a, a you know, a clustered application that has a bunch of slaves, right? You can have a create script for the slave upon joining the cluster and then you can have one for delete when the actual, when if it needs to re, uh, deregister or something like that, right? So also I mentioned earlier that group attribute in the software config, right? So that's actually um, <clears throat> indicates what type of hook uh, this should run, and basically this hook is just the interpreter that the agents will use to run the script you put in the software config, right? So we can see here that these can be things like an Ansible, uh, Ansible puppet, salt, and in our case it was script, which is just bash, like a bash script, right? And the point I want to make here is that, right, if you start using heat as a configuration management tool, right, you don't have to like necessarily learn a brand new language like you would when you're learning Ansible or salt or whatever, right? You can already use your existing configuration management scripts to do the same things, except now you're also managing infrastructure with heat, right? So this is kind of what the software deployment flow looks like, which is how things actually happen under the hood. Um, the, the, the agents, I'm going to be referencing the agents that are actually doing things. So OS collect config, basically, that lives on the instance, will use the software config transport uh, attribute of the instance to pull heat for software deployments. Uh, and upon determining a new software deployment, um, OS refresh config will trigger heat config. Uh, and heat config will basically determine the appropriate hook that will be used to execute the software configuration. Right? So this is the Ansible, Puppet, Chef, Salt, whatever. Uh, and lastly, you have heat config notify, which will use the signal transport attribute of the software deployment to deliver the status of the deployment. So if it was successful or not, or if there's a problem. Um, and this also include, includes outputs. Um, so, I want to make a couple of um, you know, uh, distinctions in compared to cloud init, right? So, for example, with cloud init, right, we, Lance already mentioned this, you can't update, right? Software deployments let you update. Um, if you've ever had to work with cloud init and create interdependencies between two different instances that are both running cloud init, and for example, you have a package on one, and then this one has to wait until this package on the first one has to come up, you would have had to deal with things like wait conditions and wait condition handles, and then you have to actually insert it into your script, and it's just it's very messy, right? This is actually built in very nicely into, into, um, into the software deployments because it'll, you can just use the depends on attribute, and I'll show that in one of my demos and how easy it is to actually create interdependencies between different software packages, software configurations. Um, and lastly, there, when you're using cloud init, there's no way for you to pass back information into heat, right? So I can, for example, if I have a, I don't know, like a yum install package as my cloud init um, script, and for example, I don't know, some, somehow the instance doesn't have internet access or something like that and it fails, you would never know. He will come back to you and say, yeah, you know, I, the stack was created successfully, right? But this, with software deployments, you can actually use outputs to determine the status, STD out, STD error, and also any custom uh, outputs that you might define, things like, for example, if you have something that generates passwords and you want to spit it back into the outputs of heat, this can be very easily done with, with software deployments. So I guess putting it all together, right, so how can you actually have infrastructure, uh, LCM, and software configuration LCM with heat, right? So we kind of came up with this framework, right, that should you know, encourage collaboration, it should leverage version control, and it should minimize the amount of different systems involved, right? So it should bring everything together into heat. Um, so this framework kind of came out in the form of a Git repository, and so I'll actually, uh, at the end there's a link to it, so uh, don't worry about that, and we'll, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the contents of this Git repository, right? So we basically created a kind of a library, right? So this is the lib folder, and in this folder we have uh, a couple different things. So we have, first of all, the basic building blocks for OpenStack infrastructure, right? So we define a whole bunch of, uh, you know, generic templates for things like networks, instances, volumes, clusters, load balances, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then we also have uh, basic building blocks for various software configurations, like 
installing a web server, adding a user, disabling IC Linux, things, very basic generic scripts that are, you know, I, I find that I constantly have to use sometimes, right? And these are um, split onto the actual uh, operating system that you're going to use, right? So for Ubuntu, it's different scripts, and for RHEL, so on and so forth, right? And lastly, we have the boot config scripts, which I mentioned earlier, that actually install the agents that are required, right? So you don't have to actually you know, figure all that stuff out. You can just reference this cloud init software config that will install it at boot time. And from there, it'll just take over and manage the software configurations using software deployments. And then we have the env directory, which is basically just a directory that holds uh, heat environment files for different operating systems. Uh, and then we have the env ext, which basically is the same as env, except the actual envi uh, environment files are links to, to, the, to the actual GitHub repo as opposed to just local paths, meaning that if you actually ever want to use this library, you only have to reference these uh, one uh, library file in there. You don't actually have to download the whole library. Um, and then we have tests, which is basically just, you know, as the name implies, a bunch of tests. However, these actually serve as really good examples if you want to get started with the library and you want to see how things work. There's basically a test for every OpenStack infrastructure component and for every software configuration component that we've written. And lastly, there's a README, which is a pretty good overall repository README. Uh, definitely, uh, if you, especially if you don't know he very well, this, this is a great way to start. So now I'm going to actually go through an example where I'm using things from this library. Um, and it's going to be a reverse proxy example, right? So the format of this is basically going to be like on the top left-hand side, I have the definition. On the bottom, I have the parameters. And on the right-hand side, it's actual visual representation of what's, what's happening. So in this case, the only thing we have originally is just a public network, and that's a, it's a provider network, right? So uh, on the left-hand side, we're actually defining here a heat lib, right, network full stack. So right, that's the name we gave um, for, for network, and this actually, what it'll do is it'll uh, provision a network, a subnetwork, a router, it'll link that router to that network, and it'll also link that router to an external network, right? Um, and the next thing is uh, actual security group, um, and you can see that it has three different inputs, a name, port, protocols, right? So we're actually just opening up port 22, port 80, port 443 on the TCP protocol. Then we have the actual instance definition, right? So again, it's he lib instance basic, right? So basic instance with takes our name, a key, an image, a flavor. Uh, and then it actually links to the network we earlier created. And it also attaches a security group to the instance port. And next one is a floating IP, right? Very basic, nothing special. And we also have a data volume, again, volume basic, not, nothing special about it. And this is where things kind of get interesting. This is where we start using software deployments. So the first software deployment we have, you see that it takes uh, four different uh, parameters, right? First of all, it takes the volume and then the instance. So where should this be attached? Um, and it, what this actually does is this isn't the actual, you know, cinder volume attach, right? This is actually um, a script that goes in and it actually goes and creates a file system on, onto that volume, and then it'll mount it on a particular path that, that you have. Um, the next software configuration is basically just an Apache web server. This is the you know, install HTTPD, basically. Uh, and lastly, we have the actual reverse proxy. And this takes two, uh, uh, two parameters, right? The instance, and then also the, you know, what's the actual pr proxy pass um, that, that you want to do, right? So we have slash Google will now redirect us to www.google.com, right? And this is where I mentioned earlier, right? Uh, in order for us to have a reverse proxy, we have to have Apache installed first. So in order for us to do that and make sure that it's in order, all we have to do is just, you know, use the depends on, um, the depends on attribute that's native to, to heat, uh, to, yeah, to heat. So I actually have a little video of how this works. Uh, hold on. I guess it doesn't. Let me just. Yeah, we're not going to do um, live demos. We don't have time. Uh, these deployments take a while, so we've recorded them just to be able to compress the deployment process into a small amount as possible. Yeah, we've sped up the, these videos. So this is the actual template I use. So you can here you can see the parameters, um, and then you'll basically I'll scroll down and you'll basically see all the resources that I just described. 
Um, so there's nothing really uh, special about anything, right? It's just a heap template that just uses the library that we built. And at the end here, we can see the reverse proxy for Google. And we also see all the outputs. So basically, I have an output for um, every software deployment. And it'll have a status, right, if it was successful or not. And this is the actual environment that I use to deploy this. And this is the stack create command. And this is where I start actually start speeding it up because and you'll see the blinker start going very fast all of a sudden. So this is basically building everything. And here we're gonna basically see the outputs of the stack, and you'll see that all the software deployments were successful. And you can see we have one for all of them for data volume, right? For the web server configuration, for the reverse proxy, for the install, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we're going to grab that floating IP, and I'll show you that Apache was installed successfully. Um, so, you know, we'll basically hit the Apache welcome page. And now we will try to do, a, we'll test the Google reverse proxy. So, it's just going to go Google, and we can see this works. And now, let's say that I want to add a new uh, reverse proxy, right? So, how could you do this? Um, so, I'm going to basically have one for, for Mirantis. And we'll see that it doesn't work, right? So I'm actually going to go back into my template, and I'm going to add um, an actual entry for it, right? So this is while the instance is running, without actually destroying the instance, right? And it's very similar to what we just had. And you just add another one. We're also going to add an output for it, so we can test it after. And I'll actually run it. And at this point, while it's actually updating, I actually went back to the to the web server to show you that while it's in the middle of updating, the instance is still alive, right? It's not destroyed. It's not being recreated from scratch, right? Um, as it would if you were to use, for example, cloud init and you were to update like a little component of cloud init, the whole instance would be destroyed and recreated from scratch, right? So that's not the case with software deployments. It supports lifecycle management at any lifecycle, part of the instance's lifecycle, right? So here I'm going to do you'll see that the top, the, the first one here is actually the reverse proxy uh, status for Mirantis that we just uh, updated, and it's successful. So I'm going to go back here, and I'll show you that it actually works. And it should lead us to Mirantis' home page. Cool. So I'll hand it off to Lance here, who will now talk about a more complex example that uh, thanks, Florin. Um, as we've had trouble with the oh, yeah. internet yeah. thing, I think I'm going to just do the same. Yeah. Uh, cool. Can you guys see that? Yeah. So um, this is a more complex uh, version or usage of the library. As you can see, you've, I've created a, a submodule um, in the in the environment here that enables um, us to use the library files inherently in the deployment. So we've got a, a, as you can see there, we've got the different NV files. We've got the tests. We've got library. Let's can see better. And uh, it shows you that we've got all these environments with us. So you can see the library file here. Yeah, I'm going to just pause again here to show you the library file itself. You see we've got all the different named instances, uh, heat lib instance basic with volume boot, with volumes, load balancer, security groups, networking, load balancer v1 for uh, v1 LBAS, basic uh, volumes, and so on and so forth. So we, we, you, you create a library of resources within this uh, file so that you can reuse them later. The, uh, and you can see now we create a separate volume or a separate a source volume for all our software with the, um, for our Carbo Cube example. And um, as you can see here, um, I've created another library file. Now, the reason, the, the reason why this is quite significant is that you could create your own library file and add this to the current, and as in augment the current library file and add extra stuff that you need that's custom to your application that you don't want to add back into the library but it's used just for your application. Um, and so here we've, we've created um, a SSK, SSH key for public addresses, or for public uh, SSH uh, key deployment, private key deployment, and some storage uh, to install some uh, packages. 
that are related just to cargo that need that cargo needs to install that needs to have to install. So as you can see, we've got different scripts in different folders. Um, it's kind of a logic thing where you keep your application stuff all in one folder structure. So we've got a configure script, deploy script, install script. Um, as we go down here, you'll see that because we're referencing the library, we have uh, just have to supply the de deploy host image and the deploy host flavor or master image, master flavor, and that will give us what we need to uh, deploy our cluster or our environments itself. And so we don't have to worry about all the other bits and pieces within our, our cluster uh, because it's already taken care of by the library. And as you see here, we've got a, a server policy where we're adding in anti-affinity affinity, which we can pass through to our clusters. Here you'll see we make use of the heat network, heatlip network router to be able to create uh, an, a router that because we want to have a multi-networked environment. And you've got the deploy network, the master network, etcd network, and the node network in here. And we, we pass all the parameters, as we said before, that our library expects of those um, different environments. And uh, it will then allow us to uh, deploy it. And as you can see, I'm pointing out that the, the networks, we're using those library uh, names within the type. As you can see here, we've got um, the master cluster, which is using Heatlib cluster basic, which is basically a resource group of nodes. Um, we haven't done the load balanced cluster version yet, um, but that's, this is the example of what um, you can need. And the parameters here, we just pass through. We want to count the name, the key, flavor, security groups, subnets. We can pass in a server policy and whether we need a, a HTTP or HTTPS proxy, because sometimes you know, a lot of our customers are behind corporate firewalls, and one could use that there to be able to do that. So here you see I've got a, a, a my node cluster as well has, been, uh, has got the similar type of format. And then we've got here what's very significant, again, with the depends on, is that we've made this deploy host depend on all the other clusters being built first. So they're all going to go together and be built, and then we'll have, once they're all built together, then you're going to have the, uh, the, this deployment will run. And there's a reason for this, and you'll see a bit later on in the, the software deployment code why we need this. And here we've got the different, uh, if you can look here, we've got uh, installing packages on the masters, publishing the SSH key, so squirting an SSH key into them, because as, as we know, Ansible needs to have an SSH key access to everything. So we generate the SSH key here within the environment. We then copy the, the public key to the, to the nodes that need to be managed, and we copy the master key to the node that is doing the managing um, without any interaction from a person here at all. It just happens. So this keeps on going. Um, we've got, uh, now we're getting to the software deployment parts of it. Um, we can see here that we've got deploy SSH key private install and, and uh, private install deployment. Again, the same as what Florent showed us earlier. We reference it. It's a group script, so it's a bash script that's running. Um, and this is the private key that gets pushed into the deployment server that's going to run the, the Ansible commands. Um, then we've got the cargo install from the software config, so we'll have a, a bunch of uh, stuff that has to happen for cargo to install, so it's a different phase. And here, we've, as we've, re we've, ref we've uh, utilized the create action, so that on cluster creation, this gets uh, done, and it's only on creation. So you don't continually uh, redo this. We're getting to an interesting part now where why we had to do a depends on for the um, the deployment of the different clusters. If you can see in the, in the, in the cargo config, we have uh, a bunch of inputs, where it's the master's names, master IPs, etcd names, and IPs, and so on and so forth, and the proxy details. And we needed this because we needed to create the inventory file for, for um, Ansible, because Ansible, as we know, runs on uh, an inventory file. So we have a bash script that creates this inventory file in the format that um, cargo needs. And we pass in all this information. And this, if you look at the bottom here where it says get attribute master cluster cluster instances names, this is what we provided as part of the library that you can get a full list of names of all the instances in the cluster by referencing the standard heat um, outputs commands. And the same with the IP addresses as well. And we feed that in, and then it, it generates this. And we've seen that there's a create and an update path to this. So both the actions, sorry. Um, and those actions will then on create and update, this will run so that you always keep your stuff up to date. And then we've got the deployment option where um, we run a run through the, the deployment. But as you can see here, in the uh, we have a bunch of outputs as well where we can get the status of each individual deployment option. So it makes it quite easy to debug it in even in Horizon, if you would like, or as um, 
Florence showed you in the console, you can run, you know, get, get the outputs and see what's happened with your deployment. Here again, we've also run a very fast deployment. Um, you'll see how we've deployed, we've spun up all the networking, we've spun up, the, we've created the network key, we're installing uh, the key. You'll see uh, going further, we'll have uh, the public key gets pushed into some of the nodes now. And the config for the, that's where we're generating this uh, inventory file. And then it's finished. And then we should have the, the creation happen where it says deploy there. And you can see that the deploy uh, creates in progress and create is done. It took 38 minutes. That's why I had to sl slice it down a bit. And that was the whole cargo deployment because cargo takes a long time to build um, the, the uh, Kubernetes cluster. And now that the deployment is complete. So, the, so what we can do now is we're going to uh, SSH into the deployment host. And I want to show you the Ansible or these, the, the Ansible inventory file that we created. So I'll change over to the uh, folder that I've put cargo in, uh, which is in opt cargo for now. It could be anywhere really. It's, and uh, in the inventory file there, um, you can see we've created the, four, the nodes here where you can see node zero through three and, um, and split it out as what as, uh, cargo expects this format of the, of the uh, inventory file. So what we're going to do now is we're going to increase the number of the nodes to five. And, um, and then we are going to split the screen in half because what I want to do is um, show the availability of the system that stays up while you do your update. So I've, we SSH again into the deploy host. Um, and this is just a contrived example of people, so I don't think that you always have to have a deploy, this way of doing things, but it just uh, it, it helps to illustrate the point. And then what I'm doing now is I'm SSHing into one of the masters. I picked uh, master zero for this. And we can run a watch command so we can see all the pods. So we're getting get pods um, from all uh, namespaces. It will come up soon. All right, now you can see we've got all the nodes here in the bottom. 0, 1, 2, and 3, and they've got Nginx proxies on 0, 1, 2, and 3. So this is a working Kubernetes cluster installed via cargo. And I'm highlighting there, there in the video. So the next part of this is to run the update, because we've now created an extra node. So I want, want you to keep an eye on the right-hand side. We're just running, running a standard uh, update, OpenStack update. Um, and you must watch the, the nodes here on the right they have, uh, we've got node three and boom, there's node four and nothing went down. Uh, the master that was doing the queries didn't go down. And what I'm doing now is I'm gonna uh, SSH into the, um, uh, and the master at uh, the deploy host again. And I, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run the, the standard SOC demo, SOC shop demo that Kubernetes uh, provide you to test to make sure that your cluster's there. And, um, but first I also want to show you that we've updated the inventory file. So uh, while I'm, you know, while we've been doing the update. So we just added that extra line into the inventory file. As you can see now, once it comes up, you'll see the node four is at the bottom there, ready to be used by the, the, the deployment that we've just done. So now I'm deploying the sock shop demo. And as you can see, and boom, we start getting a whole production of a working um, Kubernetes install. And as you can see, the containers are busy spinning up and um, getting the cells ready to be run. And so we go back to, is it on the other side? Yeah. So back to the, so <coughs> in summary, it, it can be leveraged to really run an infrastructure and software configuration lifecycle management for an, a, a project or a, a, an application that you're running. It, it's, it's very easy by using tool sets that we can create and use and reuse. It makes it easy for us to do and you only have a single pane of glass, which is really, really a single command, a one-click command. These key capabilities that we the software config um, and, and the lifecycle management can be, com you know, must be combined in a library or a, a framework that consists of a, a repository that uh, is serving as a base for this framework and an ability for people to extend and, and grow it. So it encourages collaboration within environments. We've, we've seen customers starting to use their um, versions of this type of solution uh, to create better, quicker, faster deployments. Somebody works on somebody else's stuff and improves their code. Typically like an insight 
customer open source scenario where they, they have stuff that they need to do, but they can't share it outside, so they're doing it in, inside. It's really good. And also, you can work on vision control. So you can have a heat library that you, that you pull in with a uh, sub-module command that is on a specific pull request or a specific version. And you can use that constantly. And then you, when you're ready, you can update it. And then it'll get moved to the, you can use the new libraries. There's a good workflow deployment uh, workflow process now you can use because it just keeps everything simple and, and easy to use. You have a, a single type that you can use to spin up a whole cluster of things. Or you can use nested uh, templates to create multiples of these. It's really the, the, the world's your oyster, I want to say. The, um, the update's also quite good because the update workflow will work and upgrade your application as and when, if you run an update, you have a, ba a command in there from Ansible or Puppet that says, on update command, do this, and it runs and updates your application without having to destroy your whole infrastructure behind underneath it. And, and this enables the, the cloud user to minimize the time they spend running their infrastructure or creating the infrastructure and maintaining it and spend more time developing on the application and making the applications better. I think that's a really great big win from this. And um, this is the, the, the links to the repositories. We've created an organization called Heat Extras because we think there's going to be a lot more stuff that gets added here. With, uh, we have uh, in that heat, uh, that heat Lib Extra, so the Heat Extras organization, we've got the Heat Lib, which we current, the current version of. It's actually updated since this videos, these videos were taken. So there's things that are different. So we're constantly updating. Um, there's the Heat Tutorial, which gives you the whole um, highlights of Heat Basics, Cloud Init, Software Deployments, and Vertical and Horizontal Scaling. This is what Florin wrote, and he's kindly uh, allowed us to use it within the Heat Template. It's part of what he's been doing. And there's more to come. And um, I really appreciate it if guys, you know, if you want to look at this, take a look at it, see what we can do, uh, see what if you can add anything extra, if you think that there's a way of doing stuff, create a pull request, you know, we're open to um, having this thing updated and grow as it needs to make it easier for guys to use the cloud. My version of the cargo is not quite done because I couldn't get the downscaling working and so I, had to, I couldn't, couldn't finish it, it's not ready to go up yet. But once I get downscaling working because it needs a specific command in cargo to bring the Kubernetes, to empty the Kubernetes node and then shut it down. So um, I'll do that once I'm, I've got time to work on it. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. If you guys have questions, there's mics on yeah. the other side. Yeah, we're hiring, by the way. So if anybody's interested. I do have a question. So relatively new to heat. When you send the, when you send the update via software, how does it actually get transferred from you know, your launching platform to the actual <coughs> image so uh, the agents on the on the actual um, instance will continuously they'll pull heat right so you have different ways of doing it right and it's not necessarily just heat they'll they, they can um, there's a, a whole bunch of different options you can even use like a swift storage but the most typical way is for you to just directly contact heat uh, through its API point so as long as the instance has access to the heat API endpoint it'll basically be able to identify that there's a software deployment pull it, and then it'll also use the same, um, the same or different, actually, uh, signal transport mechanism to tell heat that, okay, now this was created successfully or there's a problem or something like that. And if I can add that your software that you want to deploy, it depends on how you normally store it. If you store it in Git and you want to build it on the build host or you want to, uh, if, you, if you have a pre-built thing coming out of Garrett or out of uh, you know, one of those other environments, you can just... Uh, use that. It, we, we, in this deployment purpose, I use Git. I do, a, I do a, a, a Git pull from the cargo install. It comes down and then I work on that inside the deployment host. But you have uh, any number of ways of pulling it down. It's just really up to you what you want to, what you already have in your asset store. You already have stuff in Ansible or Puppet or um, uh, those the bash scripts, you can use those. Any other questions? Fantastic. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much.